Amen. Good morning. Yes, good morning. No, I already seen it. So, um, let's start with something simple. Tell me about design patterns, the creation of design patterns. What? What? I wasn't prepared for that. N nobody told Listen, me. You want this or not? Come on, every software developer needs to know design patterns. Mister, I'm here to offer you better insurance. So you're not the one who's supposed to know. No, sir, I'm not. So who is it then? I don't know. Hello and welcome to another episode of Smog Dev Workshop. Today we are talking about creational design patterns. If you don't know what design patterns are or you want to learn about the topic, be sure to check out the introductionary video referenced here. So, without further ado, let's get down to the creational design patterns proposed by Gang of Four. A quick reminder from the previous video, creational design patterns are responsible for efficient object creation mechanisms that will enable you to increase the flexibility and reuse of existing code. We have five of those creational design patterns. And these are factory method, abstract factory, prototype, builder and director, and famous singleton. So we are gonna dive into the first creational design pattern, the factory method, but first let me tell you what you can expect from this video and how to approach it. You don't need to learn all of the design patterns to use them effectively. You only need to understand the basics of it. There is no point in understanding each and every single design pattern unless you're going to use it. Then you pull up the reference, read and refresh it. It will come naturally to you when you actually start having design patterns in your code. So don't be afraid. This is an introduction, an overview. It will give you the basic tools to understand and use design patterns. So let's get right to it. We are starting with factory method, also known as virtual constructor. Factory method, as the name suggests, is basically a method that creates an object. So whenever you decide that you need something more than a simple constructor, perhaps you want an object that is initialized in some certain way, has some field set to determined value, or maybe had some method called on it. Then you wrap all of these additional procedures in factory method. And that's basically the gist of it. That's the basic way, that's the most basic way that you could use a factory method. But factory method actually starts to shine when polymorphism comes into play. Let's imagine a simple diagram. We have two kinds of games, chess and Scrabble. Let's connect them by a single interface called board game. All right, easy enough. Now, let's imagine a situation that we have a user and he's gonna pick a game that he wants to play during runtime. So we, as a programmers, don't know ahead of time which kind of objects we are going to create. So we are coming up with a class that contains a factory method returning board game, so an interface. And now all we have to do is inherit from that class. And we will have two subclasses. One will override our factory method and return chess. And the second one will return Scrabble. And now we are creating two objects, chess game creator and Scrabble game creator. We can store them in some sort of map or whatever. And all we have to do is look up the reference and then call the factory method. And we always get the object of appropriate type. And that's basically it. That's the gist of factory method, also known as virtual constructor. Right, but why is it called a virtual constructor? Well, in some cases, you may want to have a factory method on a class that you're actually creating. And in this case, you will be able to use a reference to an object 
to create a brand new instance of the same type without explicitly knowing which kind of object this is. As you remember from factory method, we had a class that was creating an object of given type. Whenever we have a, such a class, we can call it a factory. It is a simpler version of abstract factory, also known as kit. So what this abstract factory does? Abstract factory is responsible for creating objects that go well together. For example, our board game needs two kinds of objects, a representation of the board and a representation of the pieces that go well with this game. As you know, board for chess is different than board for Scrabble. Also, the pieces used in Scrabble are different than pieces used in chess. So how do we handle it? Well, we come up with an interface that will be called Game Factory. This interface will promise us two methods. First, we'll create a board and second, we'll create our pieces. Now, we need to make sure that whenever we are creating board and pieces, we always create a set that goes well together. So we will implement this interface in two classes. One will be containing methods appropriate for chess. And the other one, of course, will contain methods appropriate for Scrabble. Now we create an object for each factory. Chess factory, Scrabble factory. And we can assign them to an interface, the game factory. Now, whenever we call create board or create pieces on a reference that is of this type, we'll be sure that created objects belong together. They are of the classes that are within the same set. And that's basically abstract factory. To use it, we will create both factories at the beginning of our application and later, when we actually need those boards and those pieces, we will reuse the references to these factories to create an actual object. All right, our third design pattern is a prototype, also known as clone or virtual copy constructor. So what it does? Well, of course, it's copying an object without compromising its internals. But why do we need such a virtual or clone constructor? As you remember from factory method, we had a very similar case. We have a class hierarchy and we have objects that are inheriting from a common root. Now we are storing all of them in a reference of a type of this root. And we don't know what is the explicit actual type of this given object, but we need to create a copy. So instead of using something like reflection to go into those types and check, ah, what is this object? What is the class of this object? Is it an instance of this class, of that class? What's going on? Well, instead of that, we are just copying the objects with a clone method that we stitch into all of these classes that are inheriting from this common root. And whenever we call it, we are sure that an object that is being copied is of the right type. It's especially useful in languages that don't natively support uh, reflection, like C++, for example. All you have to do is call the clone method and there you have it, a perfect copy that is safe to use and of course follows the encapsulation principle from object-oriented programming fundamentals. And now, my friends, the good part. We will dive into the most complex creational design pattern, builder and director. So, imagine a situation where you have a common method of creating some objects, but they are not of the same kind. They cannot inherit from common root, for whatever reason. And in that case, what would you do? What kind of scenario this is? Well, for example, we have a game assets and these are stored in config files, maybe some assets, maybe some bitmaps, maybe some JPEGs, whatever. And now, what do we usually do? Well, first of all, we need to open the file we need to obtain a handle to this file. We need to parse it in some way. Then we need to actually build an object from this file. And at the end, we need to close the handle to this file. So four steps, they are always the same, but the objects that we will be creating cannot have a common root. It doesn't really matter why, but it happens. You know it happens. It happened to you. I remember that. <laughs> so what do you do? You come up with builder and director. Builder 
will be constructing our object and director will know how. It will know all of the steps. So we create a class called director that will store a reference to the builder and will have a method called construct. Within the method construct, we store all of the steps that we need to do, which basically means we'll call all of the builders method that are responsible for opening the file, reading the config, creating an object and then closing, right? We all, we store all of that in the construct method. Now we move our view to builder. So we create all of the steps there. We create a method to open the file, to parse the config, to create the object and to close the file. And this is not an interface. We provide a def default, default, default implementation that is empty. And now we inherit from this class. We create concrete builders. There will be many of them, and we don't want to provide default empty implementation to all of them in case that we don't need this step for this exact type. And here is the catch. Concrete builders will be stateful objects. That means they will store references or states of the actually constructed object. They will store a handle to the file. They will store our config. And most importantly, they will store our product, our constructed object that we want to create. And on top of that, they will add another method, getProduct. And why we cannot put that in the base class? Why do we have to put it over here? Well, my friends, that's the beauty of this design pattern. The get product will return a different type so they don't have to have common root. They don't have to share any interfaces because if they would, the whole point of this design pattern is kind of void. Yeah, use something else. But if they don't share this common root, they don't have a base subclass or interface that you could use to store a reference to this object, then we can use this. So how do we actually use this design pattern. Well, we start by creating a concrete builder. All right, we have it. And on the second step, we will pass that reference to constructor of director. Then we call construct on this director. The director will call off the builder's methods necessary to construct our product and it will stop there. It won't return the object that we want. Our job is to actually call get product on the concrete builder. In this way, we don't need to worry about having the same interfaces on director or on builder base class. Now, my friends, we have separated the actual algorithm of creation of the objects from the actual object being created. And the steps necessary to construct the objects are stored in the director and the actual variances of this construction are stored in concrete builders. Not in object, not in director, but in builders. Looks easy now, doesn't it? Ha! <laughs> Good. Good, you're getting it. And now the dessert. The famous singleton. I always joke that sole purpose of singleton is to have it as a one of the questions during the job interview. <laughs> Singleton is a beautiful class. It's full of promises. It will promise you that it will create only one instance of itself and that you can always access it wherever, whenever you are. Simple and easy. As a matter of fact, singleton is often referred to as anti-pattern. Why? Well, basically, it's because of that very promise. As soon as you'd say that okay, I have this single place that I can call from every piece of the code, you're kind of breaking one of the fundamental principles of object-oriented programming, which is encapsulation hermetization. And that means that no code should have access to other piece of code that it's not concerned with. So in most cases, when you create such a singleton, you don't want every single piece of application to have access to it. I could imagine a couple of examples that are actually valid for this kind of class. One of them could be logger. Every piece of your code could justify having access to logger. That's fine. 
But in other cases, why do you need an XML reader in part that is not concerned with XML at all? How is the singleton actually used and constructed? Well, it has a private field that will store a reference to one and single instance that we are going to create. It has a private constructor, so it's not possible to create an instance from outside of the class. And we have a static get instance method, which basically does the initialization of this private field. So it will create our object for the first and last time, and it will return the actual interface to the user. Easy enough, simple enough, that was Singleton. And that's everything, my friends, for today. Be sure to like, share and subscribe, because only thanks to you this channel is growing. So, do leave a comment if you enjoyed it, and do leave a comment if you didn't. Tell me why. Why? <laughs> so thank you again for watching, and see you in the next one. Cheers!